Hi, I'm Dr. J, and this is a video about p-values compared to Bayesian posterior probabilities. Uh, if you haven't watched it before, this is a third video in a three-part series, so you might want to go back and watch the second video uh, in this series where it talks about how to do the calculations for Bayesian posterior model probabilities. This video is talking specifically about situations where p-values and posterior probabilities might not agree. As usual, down below, there's a PDF version of these slides. All right, so uh, I'm going to do this through an example. So the question really is, do p-values and Bayesian posterior model probabilities agree? So here's an example. We have a binomial model. Uh, our hypothesis is that the probability of success is 0.5. Our alternative says that it's not 0.5, it's just something else. If you do a p-value calculation, when you observe 10,000 observations and 4,900 of those are uh, successes, then you get a p-value that's about 0 0.047. Okay, and if you're going to use sort of the standard cutoff that people use of 0.05, uh, then you would reject the null hypothesis. So this seems to be evidence against that null hypothesis being true. But now if you turn around and do a Bayesian approach, well, first off, we need to have a prior over our model. So let's just make those 50-50. And then we also need a prior over the parameters uh, in our alternative model where we haven't specified exactly the value for the parameter. Let's just do our standard thing and assume a uniform distribution uh, over probabilities. And now if we calculate uh, the posterior model probability associated with these assumptions here, we find that the posterior model probability is about 0.96. So that is, uh, given the data you've observed and the priors that you've made as a Bayesian, uh, you have a prior belief that the null is true with 0.96 probability. And so this seems to suggest that at least in some situations, the p-values and the posterior models completely disagree. That is, if you were making decisions based on these two uh, statistics, you would come to completely different decisions. All right, so what's really going on here? Uh, this happens enough, or it's at least well known enough perhaps, that it's given a name, it's called the Jeffrey Lindley Paradox. And it's a situation that compares, that occurs when comparing two hypotheses. And it, you have a frequentist test result, usually via p-values, that leads to a rejection of that null hypothesis. But at the same time, you have a Bayesian posterior model probability that says that that null hypothesis is true. So this apparent paradox occurs in a very specific uh, set of circumstances. And so it's good to be aware of those circumstances. So if they happen to occur, uh, you'll be aware that this might be an issue that you have to address. All right, so the first thing is that uh, the effect size has to be small. You see in our previous problem, uh, we had the 0.49 versus a 0.51 under the null value. Okay, so that's what we mean by, in this example, that effect size being small. Right? Those two probabilities are pretty close to each other. Secondly, you need to have a large a number of observations. So in this case, the example we had, we had 10,000 observations. So that was large for this problem. We need to have a null that uh, we call relatively precise. So this can happen in other circumstances, but when you're dealing with p-values, usually this is what you have, because usually your null is that the parameter is equal to a particular value, and that's what we mean by uh, precise, uh, but there are other ways that it can be relatively precise. The alternative, on, in contrast, has to be relatively diffuse. So in our example, the null, the alternative said that it's just not 0.5, and our prior distribution over that parameter said, hey, it's uniformly distributed on that probability space. Finally, uh, you have to have a, a setup where the prior model probabilities are equal, in which case, or close to equal, in which case their prior odds is about one. So that's a situation in which it occurs. Now, is this a problem? And I would say, no, this is not really a problem because there's not really a paradox here, even though it's given in the name on the previous slide. Instead, uh, really, you have to think about what p-values do and what posterior model probabilities do and understand that they're not doing the same thing. So p-values, as a reminder, measure how incompatible your data are with that model associated with the null hypothesis. And it, it says nothing in, about how incompatible the data are with that alternative. Right? So all it does is really say something about that null model and about how incompatible your data is with that model. In contrast, a Bayesian posterior model probability uh, measures the predictive 
uh, ability of a model, right, via the prior distribution. But it's really not just about a model, it's really about that model relative to other models. Okay, so if you have a situation where all the models are bad, the posterior model probability will tell you that, um, well, these ones are worse than others, but won't tell you overall how bad those models are. Um, this does require you, as a Bayesian, as doing this kind of analysis, to have at least two, possibly more, well thought out models. And what we mean by well thought out is that those models have informative priors. Okay, and so the reason that there's no paradox here uh, with two different models, uh, sorry, one analysis having p values that are significant post, but posterior model probabilities of null hypotheses being high, uh, is that these just complied two completely different measures of model adequacy. The first one just talks about the null. The other one says this null compared to some other model or some other set of models. All right, so in summarizing the uh, everything we talked about in the last three videos where we talked about Bayesian and posterior model probability calculations, uh, I want to remind you that when you have alternative hypotheses that are one-sided, then I don't even treat those as hypothesis tests. Instead, I just treat them as a parameter estimation problem and calculate relevant posterior probabilities. For uh, situations where you have a mixture where some of the hypotheses uh, are specific values and some are two-sided, um, then you can use Bayesian posterior model probability calculations. But the reminder is that really, it's just making a statement about how predictive those models were for the data you actually observed. All right, the next two videos, we're gonna start talking about uh, comparing proportions, comparing normal means. We're gonna be using all of the different uh, techniques we've been talking about now for weeks, uh, where we talk about things like p-values, confidence intervals, credible intervals, uh, these posterior model probability calculations, and so forth. I hope to catch you there.